Hi everyone, welcome to today's broadcast. This webinar is being brought to you by the Clean Energy Group uh, as part of our Resilient Power Project. And our topic today is New Initiatives in Community Resilient Power. And before we get started, I'd like to go over a quick housekeeping slide. Today all of our participants are in listen-only mode, so we will not be able to hear you. You can connect to the audio portion of this webinar using your computer speakers or a telephone, and there are some instructions on your screen for that. Uh, we are encouraging all of our webinar participants today to submit your questions as you think of them during the webinar by typing them into the question box in your webinar console and hitting send. Uh, we will be reading your questions throughout the webinar and queuing them up, and we will have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So again, please submit your questions as you think of them and don't wait till the end. And finally, this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar uh, and all of our previous webinars available on our website at the web addresses that you see on your screen. And with that, I'd like to pass this over to Lou Milford, the Clean Energy Group President. Thanks, Samantha. Um, and thank uh, everyone who um, is uh, listening in. Uh, this webinar is about a problem that's uh, getting worse, and that is severe weather and damages from storms and um, power outages that occur and the impacts that result to communities and vulnerable populations, the poor, the elderly, the disabled. Um, and that's the bad news. There is, to, to some extent, maybe some good news in that there are uh, new emerging cleaner technology solutions like solar and storage that can be installed in critical facilities, community facilities, and affordable housing to ride out the storm and protect people. Uh, we see this as a kind of a next generation of climate resilience that we call uh, resilient power. So my job is really simple. I'm just going to provide a little context and then introduce people and turn it over to the good speakers we have today. So if you could just do the next one, Sam. Uh, we're a clean energy group. We're a national nonprofit that works on uh, clean energy solutions, uh, finance issues, and policy around the country, mostly at the state and community level. Uh, we've done a, a paper on this topic that you see there. Um, and this work has um, principally been funded by some very good uh, foundations, JPB Foundation, CERDNA, and Kresge, and we're very grateful to them um, to try to advance this work around the country. If you could do the next one, Sam. Uh, what this project is about and its goal is to increase, uh, as it says, investment in cleaner, resilient power systems. We've relied for a long time on dirty diesel generators that fail. Uh, we think we can do better. Um, and there are emerging technology trends and finance trends that we think uh, can introduce and bring into uh, community facilities, affordable housing facilities, new technologies like solar that's been around for a bit, uh, but solar and batteries that provide a lot more protection going forward, and we can protect the vulnerable populations from these problems. We've got to do a lot of projects. We've got to change some policy. We've got to get funding, um, but we're uh, optimistic there's a lot more we can do, and there are some papers that are noted there that we've uh, produced as a result of this in the last five or six months that uh, if you want to get into a little uh, more detail, those can give you more information. Next uh, slide, Sam. The, the main topic here today is, um, is resilient power and community facilities. And th this quote is a lift from a blog we wrote about reliable technologies and the disparity essentially between the haves and the have-nots. Um, if we look to um, uh, many of the you know, high-end private facilities, whether they're data centers or banks, um, budgets there are relatively infinite um, for uh, cleaner, or not cleaner necessarily, but more resilient technologies, whether fuel cells or others. Uh, the problem comes where, the, where it's needed the most, where the protection is needed the most um, for vulnerable populations and housing and uh, shelters and the like, um, and there's a need there to introduce these technologies to protect those people. Um, and we think that that job can be done. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, but what the, what the um, webinar today will talk about is how some leading people are beginning to look at these uh, solutions in, a, in the affordable housing community development world. And we think it's a very exciting uh, trend, and uh, we'd like to see this done uh, uh, much more aggressively around the country. So let's return to the next one. I'll introduce the people who are here, and uh, then you can really hear from the experts. Um, so today we have Rob Sanders, who's our uh, Senior Finance Director at Clean Energy Group. Uh, Rob was a longtime banker with the Reinvestment Fund, uh, a CDFI in Philadelphia, um, uh, you know, a perfect background of both energy lending 
uh, and affordable housing lending. Uh, we have Jared Lang, who's the Sustainable Development Manager of the National Housing Trust. Jared uh, does a great deal of green design, resource efficiency into the uh, NHT Enterprise portfolio, um, and has been looking at some projects in this area, so he's got a lot to tell us about grappling with some of the real-world issues here. And Tom uh, Ozdaba, who is the VP of uh, Green Initiatives at Enterprise Community Partners, um, who's the head of Green Initiatives, and he's been has a goal of making all affordable housing green by 2020. And Tom is a longtime social um, uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneur. So I'm going to turn this over to Rob and really get going with the agenda. Okay, thanks, Lou. Uh, as Lou said, uh, we see a critical need for reliable distributed electricity generation and resiliency in a broad range of community facilities, and these would include multifamily affordable housing, uh, police, uh, fire stations, uh, schools, hospitals, community emergency centers. Um, one of the best state programs we've seen uh, is the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources program uh, called Community Clean Energy Resilience Initiative, which funded 31 uh, community resilient power projects uh, with $40 million in incentives. Uh, and, and this program includes a uh, technical assistance fund, which we see as being a, a really uh, essential uh, component of having a good uh, resilient power program. The awardees included um, school shelters, police and fire stations, municipal fueling stations, other uh, community shelters, wastewater treatment facility, hospital. Um, the 31 uh, Massachusetts Community Resilient Power Projects were supported, lar supported largely with state grants. Uh, there are also existing financing options that are, are important to keep in mind uh, that municipalities and housing and community developers uh, have access to. One of these categories is bond financing. Uh, for instance, general obligation bonds are available to government entities, uh, particularly for uh, resilient power projects, uh, among other many other uses, uh, for uh, government-owned buildings, 501c3 bonds for hospitals, universities, affordable housing, and community facilities to uh, to uh, implement projects, uh, school construction bonds, uh, which would also be available for emergency shelters that are often included in uh, in schools. Um, there are also third-party ownership structures. A lot of energy storage developers provide third-party ownership and lease financing to government, commercial, and nonprofit entities to do projects. Uh, this eliminates uh, upfront costs in many instances. It transfers the uh, development and performance risk, uh, the operations and maintenance, uh, to the developer and not to the uh, owner of the building. Uh, and I think, uh, in our minds, the question is, can lease financing and third-party ownership do for energy storage what it did for residential solar PV, uh, which was to drive tremendous growth in residential solar? Uh, in many ways, I think we're at the uh, same stage that solar PV was 10 years ago uh, in terms of resilient power and energy storage, that, um, that, uh, uh, and we're hoping that lease financing will, will drive a lot of, of uh, implementation and growth in, in uh, energy storage. Um, clean energy financial institutions, I'll name a few. Uh, New Jersey Energy Resilience Bank uh, is up and running with $200 million in initial capitalization and additional capital coming in over the next three years. Uh, and then New York Green Bank or the Connecticut Green Bank, which was uh, formerly CEPHIA, um, and other state clean energy funds all have financing programs for clean energy projects, including advanced uh, clean energy technologies like uh, solar plus storage. And then finally, uh, credit enhancements. These are risk reduction methods that improve the credit worthiness of projects and reduce the cost of borrowing, especially important in early uh, market development technologies. Um, so. We've written extensively about this. Uh, one publication that uh, may be of interest is uh, Reduce Risk, Increase Clean Energy, which is on our website and talks a lot about how credit and enhancement has been used to advance clean energy and related technologies. So we, we first started uh, taking a long look at community resilient power in a Baltimore paper that we did. Uh, we were asked to explore how can cities deploy more solar in low-income communities, 
and be more power resilient. Uh, we started by looking at Baltimore's DP3 report. That's their, their disaster preparedness and planning project report uh, that created an inventory of critical facilities and infrastructure. Uh, what we recommended uh, was to focus on community buildings and critical services and not necessarily initially uh, single family housing in, um, in low income communities. The full report can be downloaded at that uh, link at the bottom of the page. Uh, and it, 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 uh, it outlines an approach to how cities can begin to think about uh, community resilient power. Uh, within the area of community facilities, we have a special interest in affordable housing and assisted uh, living facilities. This is multifamily affordable housing. Um, small battery storage systems combined with on-site generation are needed for elevators, emergency lighting, booster water pumps, a range of uh, building applications. And many of these resilient power projects can be structured with no upfront costs. Now to help jumpstart some community resilient power projects, we set up a small resilient power technical assistance fund, which is available to owners and developers of multifamily affordable and supportive housing, uh, community facilities, assisted living facilities, uh, and to municipalities uh, with specific projects. Uh, we can provide limited project pre-development funds for near-term resilient power projects. It's not a lot of money, uh, so we're focused on uh, being sure that near-term projects can get started and get over the hump uh, by helping with some of those pre-development costs and scoping these projects. Uh, what are those uh, scoping services? Often it's, it's reviewing biz, uh, building plans, analyzing utility bills, identifying uh, critical loads to be covered, uh, preparing project budgets and pro forma, submitting funding and financing applications, and coordinating and integrating uh, energy storage with the solar PV developer. One example uh, where we provided support from our technical assistance fund and consultant budget has been in New York City for affordable and supportive housing. Uh, we're, pro we're providing some funding to Bright Power for three New York City multifamily housing projects uh, that they are providing project development services to. One of these is the Via Verde Apartments project in the Bronx. It's a retrofit project. Uh, the building already has a 66 kW solar PV array that was installed by Bright Power which can be retrofitted with energy storage to cover critical building loads. The batteries and the related equipment, um, such as a, a bi-directional inverter for charging, discharging uh, from the grid and to the grid, will be located in the basement in the telecom room, which is adjacent to the main electric room. And uh, one consideration is that um, for this size system, um, it's about a, a refrigerator size uh, plus a panel box for it. Um, the building also has a 150 kW natural gas-fired emergency generator already in place, uh, which covers the common area lighting and elevators, but not the water booster pumps, which will be covered by the solar plus storage system. And the solar uh, and storage equipment will also provide black start capability to the backup generator so that if the grid's down, um, the generator will kick in. <laughs> you, you still need uh, electric uh, power to to fire up the generator, um, uh, gas power generator. So uh, this, the uh, solar plus storage will provide that black start capability. Oh, one last thing I'd like to emphasize um, is that we believe that it's important to remember that financing is just one key public resource that is needed to accelerate the deployment of resilient power. Uh, financing is not sufficient in itself. It's not the silver bullet. It's a necessary uh, aspect of, of early, stay, early market development, project development. Um, so also needed are technical assistance, support for pre-development costs, and consistent supportive policy. So with that, um, I'll stop and hand it over to you, Jared. Great. OK. So um, I'm Jared Lang. I'm the Sustainable Development Manager for National Housing Trust. Um, we are uh, a policy organization, and we advocate for affordable housing um, uh, with the federal government and in the states. Um, 
we are a lender and we lend to affordable housers um, trying to get deals off the ground and we have a group called NHT Enterprise um, that actually uh, owns and operates uh, about 3,000 affordable rental units on the East Coast in Illinois. Uh, I'm, so as the sustainability um, leader in the organization, um, I'm, we do a lot of certifications uh, across our properties, um, a lot of energy and water projects. Uh, we have the first green certified, um, enterprise green certified property in D.C. <clears throat> and um, when we do our new projects, we really shoot for 20% energy reduction. Uh, across our projects. So just a little background on um, who we are and what we're up to. And I should say that I was asked to speak about uh, an actual project um, that we were, were undertaking. And it's a solar project. And we're trying to be smart and include battery backup into the project. Um, it's, it's definitely it's hard enough to do solar. And we're finding that. Um, it's not that easy uh, to figure out how to add on battery storage, but we're excited about the benefits and we are trying to make it work. So we're, well, this is new and I will answer as many questions as I can uh, throughout the process, but just keeping in mind that you know we're still exploring the project to see if we can make it work. Um, so oh, this is just another slide. Uh, that's actually me <laughs> over on the left there. Uh, and our, one of our new solar installations. Uh, we have six solar installations, so we're getting better at installing solar. And uh, battery backup is kind of a new foray for us. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our Channel Square project and battery storage on Channel Square. Um, just to give you a little context, uh, Channel Square is in Washington, D.C. Um, as you can see, this is the U.S. Capitol. Uh, this is Channel Square. This is the Nationals baseball stadium. This is the Pentagon. Um, and the, uh, the residents um, asked us to come in to the property uh, in late 2013 and help them purchase it and maintain it and keep it affordable for the long term. So we recently did a, a phase one energy and water upgrade um, and included uh, new locals shower heads and uh, aerators, um, a whole new central plant, some interior and exterior lighting, and we've been purchasing all of our power uh, from wind. Uh, we've been buying wrecks for our power. So just a quick little overview. <clears throat> so we're looking at doing this battery storage project at the same time that we're doing a solar insulation. We, uh, this is the sort of the general scope of the solar project. Excuse me one sec. <coughs> so um, the, the solar project is about uh, 300 kilowatt hours. It's about 240 kilowatt size solar system and um, 72 panels of solar thermal. We're going to do a combination of photovoltaic and thermal, um, which is uh, kind of our our strategy, if we have uh, central hot water on, in a building, which we do here, we like to try to do some solar thermal. Um, it's a good bang for the buck. And then with the rest of the space, we're going to be doing uh, photovoltaic. As you can see right here, these are sort of shaded areas um, that we weren't, we can't really put solar on. So we've been talking with a group um, called Solar Grid Storage. And essentially what they do is they will provide us the battery um, and the inverter, which will enable us to hook up to our solar system. And we can either purchase it from them. Um, and they t they're telling us the cost is around $250,000. Or uh, we can actually um, sign up an agreement for them to lease it. And essentially, it would be free. And we would receive the benefits um, of having uh, battery backup on our site. Uh, and they would receive the benefits of operating the system. Um, so this is the, an actual picture of the 
the uh, battery. It kind of comes in a, it's a large cargo container, almost like what you'd see on the back of a tractor trailer. So one of the issues that we're trying to work out is where to fit it. Um, and that's been a bit of a challenge. And, you know, there, there are some comments here about, you know, here, this is where the inverter is, this is a switch gear, this is a battery. And I, I'm, I'm starting to learn a little bit about the technology of this battery system um, and where uh, it's going to be able to be useful for us. So, you know, we thought that we were trying to think about, you know, why go through this trouble uh, of this battery storage? <clears throat> so we've been uh, very interested in this idea of resiliency. And some of the funders that we work with uh, are some of the funders that uh, Clean Energy Group works with also have been asking us about our, our original uh, six solar system. And, you know, if the grid goes down, would we be able to use the power from them? And originally we thought that we would. And we were very excited about the idea that we, you know, we could use solar when the grid went down. Um, and we quickly realized that uh, in our uh, interconnection agreements with the utility, we're actually uh, we're required to shut our systems down when the grid goes down. I guess uh, the explanation that we received was that they're concerned about power surges along the lines, and while the uh, crews are working on the systems, they want to make sure that they're disabled. And um, if we were pushing power onto the grid, that might sort of change the scenario for them. So. The, we, we sort of had this in mind, and we started to realize, wow, we're, we're going to have to be able to get off the grid um, if we're going to have these solar systems provide power. <clears throat> so we started to look into what types of solutions that we would need. And this battery idea came up, and um, you know, uh, Clean Energy Group and Rob and Lou reached out to us, and we started this conversation uh, with solar grid storage about battery. Um, so, you know, we're pretty excited about the idea that we could reduce the cost of the system because solar grid storage would provide a few of the components for us. Um, we also, you know, there's, there's going to be a warranty on the equipment that solar grid storage provides. Um, they're going to give us a guaranteed uh, output of the battery and our system. Um, and then these are actually benefits that they're going to receive, these two on the bottom, because we, we believe we're going to approach this as a lease. But you can shave your peak power, um, which is, you know, in high times, you can take power, instead of taking power from the grid, you could take it from the battery, which is cheaper. Um, and then you can reduce your demand charges, uh, which is uh, another benefit that we've sort of been looking at. Um, at, the, at this time, we're really interested in the resiliency story, and we're really looking at the reductions in the installation as just an opportunity to cover our costs um, for the uh, for all the work that it's going to take to coordinate this the setup. So, okay, so <laughs> these these are um, they, you know it's it's a nice idea. Uh, and then we're facing a bunch of challenges that we're trying to work through. <clears throat> we're really excited about this as an opportunity. And uh, we definitely have some hurdles. Uh, so we, we realized, so in the bottom right, you're looking at kind of a, a basic diagram of all the connections that need to be made between the solar on top of the roof, the battery, the meters, the building pa system panel, the utility meter, and then the actual grid. So engineering those uh, connections, making sure all those things work, and figuring out the cost of adding this additional component um, is definitely a little challenging. It's going to take us time to work out. And as you know, time is money. So um, you know we're, we're uh, trying to figure out, uh, figure that cost in. Um, you know, we're, gonna, we're really going to have to figure out how to come put that battery design into the solar design. This is something new for us. Um, we're just really starting to get good at solar, uh, and now we're adding a new component on top of that. Um, 
because this this battery uh, system is so actually so large, actually, we're trying to figure out where to put it, and we have to figure that uh, there's a kind of a line loss in the power over across the property. So we're looking for places that are closest to our central plant, but those happen to be parking lots, and there's some there's some tricky things about being on an urban site and figuring out where to put such a large um, battery. Um, then we have an existing generator. Uh, it works pretty poorly, actually, and it, uh, it doesn't uh, deliver everything we need it to. Um, but we have to figure out if we're going to decommission that um, or if we're able to tie it in. And there are some generators that are able to be controlled from this battery. So we're kind of working our way through that. Um, then we need to, you know, provide access to the battery for maintenance. That has a lot to do with the location. Um, and, you know, I would say all of these factors kind of brought together are really require us to do a lot of coordination. Um, and it's new for us. And, you know, the first one's always the toughest. The second one's a lot easier. Uh, the third one's even easier. Um, and, you know, our thoughts now are kind of like financing and installing solar is hard enough, and we're just trying to figure out how to make this battery piece work. We're really excited about it, um, and we think we're going to be able to do it. Uh, but it's sort of like uh, as, a, as a developer, we need to be smart about um, our costs and our benefits and trying to see if, if the cost are higher than the benefits in this first uh, project, can we, do we see a light at the end of the tunnel and a way to get costs down um, so that the, the benefits outweigh the cost? So um, that's it for me. If you want to talk further about, uh, this is my contact info. I'm happy to talk to you about some of the challenges and how we're working through things. Uh, happy to help uh, with other developers out there. Great, thanks very much, Jared. And before we move on to Tom, I just want to remind everyone to please type your questions in as you think of them. We do not have that many questions up so far, so, uh, so do type them in. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, Tom Ostaba with Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, I'm just going to briefly give you a, a bit of an introduction to Enterprise and then uh, build right off of the conversation uh, that Jared was having and, and, and talk about it at a more broad scale. So Enterprise Community Partners was created about 30 years ago by Jim Rouse. So when, when he created Enterprise, he set it his mission to end poverty in a generation. Obviously, that's not been done. Um, but we continue to work very hard and have been um, one of the uh, leaders in providing uh, financing and, and technical assistance, programmatic support for affordable housing over the last uh, 30 years. And in the last 10 years, we've created a very robust program to help people work on their <clears throat> sustainability uh, approaches from creating a enterprise green communities, which is a lead-like standard specifically designed for the affordable multifamily sector, uh, and as well as providing extensive uh, technical assistance tools and support to organizations who are building, owning, and operating affordable housing. In our green work, um, and you can see we have a national presence with offices uh, in many locations around the country. Uh, we do business in virtually every state in the country and, uh, uh, and are really um, interested in, in as this emerges, this resilient power conversation emerges as something that we can make sure we use our platform to help communities, help developers, help uh, building owners to embrace these opportunities, just as you heard Jared describe what NHT is uh, looking to do. Um, this just talks a little bit about our green communities framework. We really look at everything from design to operations to resident engagement. Uh, include things like health and the health of residents to location and connectivity to transportation, et cetera. So it's a fairly holistic approach um, to the buildings uh, itself. And, and as with sustainability over the last uh, decade has moved, uh, we're seeing a similar move to moving beyond individual buildings and recognizing things that happen on a neighborhood scale 
uh, at a city scale and a regional scale to make um, these sorts of opportunities really work. And uh, we've, con we've significantly extend expanded our work to help communities work at a neighborhood scale where, <clears throat> excuse me, where infrastructure buildings and distributed systems all have an interface and where really there's a sweet spot between scale, policy at the local level as well as capital and capital deployment and allows you to do things that's in, at a scale that you can't do on an individual building. Uh, and we'll see how some of this translates uh, as we go forward. Um, we're trying to solve for many things at that scale, including more affordable housing units. Uh, we're trying to incre increase housing security by lowering the costs of living in housing, including utility expenses and providing a hedge against future expenses. We're trying to build communities that are healthy, sustainable, and, and resilient and connect to transit and opportunity. Uh, we see this emerging area of growth um, uh, in terms of things like resilient power is really an extension of what's been going on for the last 15 years. You know, Jared's talked about you know the transition from preserving affordable housing to um, making it more efficient, both in terms of energy and water, to embracing solar, to starting to look at solar grid storage, and you can see how this conversation starts to open up to. Um, uh, open up to a range of opportunities to uh, organize capital, provide programmatic support, and help facilitate project development that allows these kinds of projects to emerge in communities. I'm just going to highlight three areas where we're really focusing intensively. One is in Denver, uh, the Sun Valley neighborhood, uh, which is just beginning a, an extensive master planning process. It's a very large area, 250 acres, that will go on uh, through extensive change over the next uh, 20 years, and we want to help them think through infrastructure, buildings, and distributed systems so that resilient choices, particularly around power, are, are baked in from the very beginning. So some of the conversation you heard from Jared around how do they take an existing property and make it more resilient with a few pieces from, from solar to solar grid storage to reducing demand, we want to look at that at an entire neighborhood scale and consider the infrastructure opportunities that go along with that. Similar excuse process me, Tom, going. Tom, excuse yeah. me. Um, we've got a couple of messages coming in that it, some folks are having a difficulty hearing you. So if you could please speak um, directly into your microphone, that might help. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Is uh, hopefully that's a little bit better. Um, we're going through a sing similar exercise in Chicago with the redevelopment of a historic public housing site that's going to be developed into a full. Uh, mixed residential and commercial neighborhood uh, with over a thousand new units um, uh, at 35 percent of which will be affordable so we've been looking extensively at whether there's a shared heating and cooling system a district heating system for that redevelopment as well as looking at community solar uh, opportunities that can provide solar across the site uh, and and looking at opportunities for for things like stormwater management as we start to see how the technology and the energy imperatives are evolving, things like distributed storage, uh, solar grid storage, for example, become opportunities that we can layer in to this process. And it really becomes an exercise uh, towards you know looking at the platform and the neighborhood and understanding what assets can be brought into that community that will provide resilience over time and then figuring out how to finance those third project in Los Angeles, the little Tokyo neighborhood, a very historic uh, uh, neighborhood, uh, one of the largest Japanese-American neighborhoods in the, in the country. Uh, it's going through very substantial uh, redevelopment with some gentrification pressure. As the region develops uh, a light rail system, they're looking at a regional transit hub in the middle of this neighborhood that's really going to profoundly change the character of that. We're helping them to plan for that, uh, both in terms of preserving their cultural identity, uh, uh, pursuing environmental stewardship, uh, as well as doing good uh, work on their placemaking. As part of that, we've taken a look at a, at a high level at what opportunities they have for resilient infrastructure that can support uh, the future of this neighborhood um, in, a, in a way that meets the sustainability imperatives that we face, as well as creating opportunities potentially to build wealth in this community. Um, I'm just going to walk you very, there's just a high level view of the site and how that fits within greater Los Angeles. 
I'm just going to walk you through a few things that we've been looking at. One is a district wastewater management system. You can see how we're trying to build shared infrastructure within that context. And uh, there's just some basic information there for reference. We can always talk more about that. Um, district stormwater management, again, very simple, but looking at ways to have a huge environmental impact with a positive economic uh, return as well. Um, shifting into specifically the energy side, we looked at a few components. One was a community solar model and said, you know, if you were really to build out at a neighborhood level the full solar capacity, what would that look like? And, you know, it was a very significant opportunity there. Obviously, that's not something that can be done immediately or all at once. It would be built out over time. Um, but it lends itself to this conversation that Jared was talking about. What are the opportunities to further that system by also co contemplating the storage opportunities, considering the interface necessary for electric vehicle charging, uh, as well as looking at other opportunities to engage the utility uh, for managing peak, uh, peak demands uh, throughout their system, uh, as well as having an, uh, essentially effectively an islandable neighborhood that could provide at least some level of emergency power if the grid ever uh, warranted that. And so we've started to look at that as well, um, starting from the solar side but looking more extensively. We also looked at a heating and cooling system that could be shared uh, for all new development in that community that would um, look to substantially reduce energy use by uh, benefiting from load diversification as well as right-sizing equipment and having more efficient equipment that allows this system, once all connected, to fuel switch or upgrade technology over time in a much more systematic way, uh, significantly reducing the cost for energy uh, over time in that community. Uh, it's also a good strategy from a, how do you reduce the cost of affordable housing to move that capital off of the pro forma for the real estate project and into a utility model uh, that uh, reduces the capital burden on the affordable housing development. From a district heating and cooling system, you do have an opportunity to consider an array of technologies from a simple natural gas system to one that's a cogen, both power and heat, um, or to go towards more novel technologies uh, or lower carbon technologies over time. And again, it's about setting that context so that over time those changes can be identified and pursued in an effective way. Um, some of our work more specifically around resiliency, we've been very active in New York City uh, after Hurricane San uh, Sandy to identify ways to help buildings uh, adapt and, and plan for similar events in the future and create the opportunity for them uh, to operate more effectively. Looking at um, hot water heated buildings with uh, combined heat and power systems and how they're able to remain operating when the rest of the grid goes down to working with uh, the utility there, Con Edison, and the New York uh, City Housing Authority, Public Housing Authority, to um, move uh, a, a, over a thousand of their housing units uh, from a situation in which they're underserved by the utility uh, and, and potentially the first in line to be bearing the brunt of any brownout or blackout scenarios to, to an area that could be producing uh, both power as well as helping to mod modulate the demand across the entire city on behalf of the utility. And so we're looking at a microgrid opportunity that could include grid storage, uh, combined heat and power generation, as well as solar uh, at a fairly significant scale in a major part of that uh, of the city. And so again, it becomes a process of working in between the property owners, the local government, and the respective utility owners to figure out how to make a system like that work. It's time intensive and takes quite a bit of back and forth and, and uh, really working through how to make a project like that pencil out. One of the things in the course of doing this, and this is just an illustrative graph to illustrate that all of these activities really represent revenue producing assets and if done right, create opportunities for communities who largely get left behind when these investments get made to have an opportunity to participate more fully in those investments and by doing so have some opportunity to allocate some of that revenue, so it's positive cash flows uh, from those assets into helping us solve for other issues within the community, whether it's lowering project risk, lowering utility bills through a rebate structure for low-income people, providing support to the community development organizations, or even creating a fund 
for that community so they have the ability to invest in other project opportunities that come along in the future or simply build equity over time. Uh, those are things that we want to help organizations and communities uh, or community development organizations really pursue as we see resilient power conversations start to create this opportunity to look at infrastructure building and distributed systems all in one place. There are lots of benefits that we try to map from residents to property owners to other benefits at the city or community scale. We continue to do that. Um, and, uh, and in each case, we see sort of a different matrix, if you will, mapping benefits uh, and see different priorities emerge, uh, as, as you saw just from the very, very preliminary review of some of the profit opportunities we're pursuing. We have now probably a emerging portfolio of about 15 to 20 similar projects in communities across the country that are looking to do work at this scale. Just waiting for a slide transition here. I think that's actually the last slide. Okay, I did take out one other slide. So I'll just I'll just speak for for 30 seconds just on some of the challenges. It's it's not dissimilar to what you heard from Jared. You know, these projects take quite a bit of time. They need a lot of capacity in communities that traditionally don't have a lot of capacity. Uh, there are extensive, complex relationships between local government, between utility providers, uh, and potential investors, all that need to be sorted out to make projects like this happen. Um, I think our interest in continuing to pursue these projects is that we see an, a real opportunity to help bring better capital into communities to solve for these issues in a way that allows the community to have a greater stake in those investments that get made and, and, and correspondingly to gain more of an investment uh, benefit from those projects as well. So look forward to questions and uh, discussion from here. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so now I'm going to pass it over to Lou. Uh, Lou, have we gotten any good questions in? Yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, there are kind of two categories. So um, there's there are a whole series of questions around um, the project that Jared's working on, the solar grid storage project. And let me just go through a whole list of things. Maybe if both Rob and um, and Jared can just you know take some notes and try to just touch on these. Uh, I want to say uh, that we have a paper coming out, uh, which is called Solar Storage 101, uh, in a couple weeks that might answer a lot of these questions. Um, so everybody who's on this uh, webinar today will get a copy of that. We'll go into a lot of the design features, and maybe a lot of these questions will be answered, but maybe not. Um, and somebody asked whether the slides are going to be up, and they will. So Sam will give you that information at the end. So let me just, and then I've got some questions for Tom as well, but let's see if we can spend maybe five or six minutes, uh, Rob and uh, Jared, just kind of hitting these. So uh, questions are, you know, contact for solar grid storage, we can provide that. You know, better design of that, it's not a very pretty box, is there a, maybe, and I know you guys can't fix that, but any thoughts on that? Questions on the upfront cost and financing. In other words, how is it that there's no upfront cost? What's the, what's the model? How does this work uh, in the system? Uh, uh, does the battery system affect the warranties that are in, in existence uh, for the solar system? Uh, location and parking issues, questions such as, couldn't this be on the roof? I think it's a weight question, but maybe you have a better answer. Um, uh, is there some reality to the fire hazard and battery issues? You know, people have talked about local fire uh, code issues around um, uh, batteries. Um, uh, are the O&M costs included within the system costs that were described? Uh, does NHT have to contribute any money to the installation? Uh, did you guys think about CHP as part of the system? Uh, there's a question about islanding, sort of how does that work, uh, if you know. Um, uh, and then I think I think a last sort of generic question, I think someone from HUD, is there uh, any thoughts to how to change or modify HUD policy you know, essentially to help these systems make their way into existing public housing authorities. So that's a mouthful uh, of, uh, of uh, questions. Um, I don't know if, Rob, if you want to hit that first, or Jared, it's up to you guys, but if you can maybe try to figure out how to, within you know, three or four minutes, try to hit on those, and then we can follow up maybe with more detail. 
Um, Jared, you may have a, a specific re response to the uh, question about batteries, uh, whether they affect the solar PV warranty. If, if I could just jump in, I think, Rob, yeah. if you could just maybe just generally describe the solar grid storage financing model, I mean, because yeah. you know, that would answer a lot of these questions. Let me, let yeah, me start there. That's what I was going to say. Why don't, Rob, why don't you go ahead and then I'll just jump in. You can ask, defer to me wherever. Yeah. The, uh, the, solar, uh, the solar grid storage model is a, a third-party ownership uh, a leasing model uh, where their business model is based upon uh, operating in PJM where there are uh, good uh, frequency regulation uh, revenues, which means that you know, the, ba the grid has to be balanced uh, every moment of the day and night. Uh, the amount of power being drawn from the grid has to be uh, supplied to the grid. And so uh, uh, storage, battery storage is particularly well suited in doing this, the small charging discharging to the grid uh, for uh, to keeping it balanced and, and regulated well. And uh, so these, the solar grid storage uh, uh, model is 250 kW systems, larger systems, uh, like the one that Jared's looking at. Um, and what they do is to provide the smart inverter, uh, this bi-directional inverter free. Uh, so you swap out the inverter from the solar PV development. And they, they meaning solar grid storage, gets all the benefit of the frequency regulation revenue. And that's sufficient to pay for the installation of the system itself and keeping it on site. Uh, the other uh, uh, benefits of resiliency or uh, demand reduction, peak shaving, all can be uh, uh, may, uh, uh, retained by the host or building owner. But basically, that's, that's why there's no upfront cost, is that their uh, solar grid storage model is that it, they make out well and pay out their investors by simply uh, participating in the frequency regulation market. I have another uh, response on the fire codes question. Uh, this, this is, a, uh, because it's new, it's a lot like uh, codes regarding uh, solar PV uh, were initially. How do you cite these? Uh, what are the uh, requirements? I, all I know is that municipalities are tackling this problem now. Uh, for instance, in Los Angeles, uh, the, the, one of the first uh, demonstration projects will be in a fire station, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the fire stations in, um, in Los Angeles, uh, to prove out the fact that lithium ion batteries are not going to set fire to the fire station. Jerry, maybe on the question of the, um, like, uh, I know you guys have talked about this with solar grid storage in terms of your contribution and sort of the financial benefits to you and how this might work out, maybe to be a good deal if it all works out. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, we were, we're trying to figure out what the value of, <clears throat> our estimate is that we're probably going to save about, um, Twenty thousand dollars or so, twenty twenty five thousand dollars on the inverters um, that the battery storage uh, company would pay instead of us, and we'll likely just use that uh, that twenty five thousand dollars to do all the coordination uh, around this. So we're assuming that we're probably just going to get battery storage at no cost, and we would be happy with that. That would that would be a that's, that would be a model that worked for us. <clears throat> Terrific. There are, there's also a question, Lou, you asked about CHP. Yeah. Uh, a lot of folks are uh, beginning to uh, look at uh, uh, how small CHP in multifamily affordable housing or other community facilities can be tied with uh, energy storage, um, both as, again, a black start capability for the CHP uh, but also to, to cover additional um, uh, critical loads. That's happening in, in Chicago with the Hispanic Housing Development Corporation uh, and the Affordable um, um, Community Energy Organizations, Green, Jeff Greenberger's group. It's also happening in New York City under Bright Power's work. Uh, Rob, maybe one other question that came up also is in connection with the Via Verde, the smaller system. Um, there, maybe just touch on that a little bit on the you know the larger 250 systems versus the smaller ones and the need to look you know 
uh, more closely and at the opportunities that may be there for the smaller systems. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, the, the benefit of, of uh, resiliency is, is, is uh, limited by, uh, by size and expense initially uh, in the sense that um, a 250 kW system works very well uh, if, if you're covering certain kinds of load for certain durations. The more battery storage, uh, uh, the, the better, obviously, for covering uh, loads, and depending, especially if you're covering it for a long duration. Um, but what a lot of people are beginning to realize is that having a limited amount of, of uh, storage would be very useful, too, whether it's for uh, booster water pumps, which don't have a, a, a large load associated with them, or for this black start capability for uh, furnaces and for uh, other kinds of backup generation. So a small system being maybe 10 kW or, or two 10 kW systems are fit in a basement, uh, a larger system, 250 kW, 25 times the size of the 10 kW system, that needs a pallet and a couple parking spots. Yeah, this is Tom Lou. I would just sure. add a quick comment on that, that, you know, I think this, um, this modular cogen opportunity, you know, in, in many markets could actually be a leading edge of uh, grid storage and, and sort of larger opportunity, right? The regulatory and local government work that needs to be done with the utility and with the local government to make grid storage and all that interface really, really robust and effective can take some time, but a cogen opportunity can make sense right out of the gate. And, and the key there is to really envision that entire scenario and then phase your projects accordingly based on what makes economic sense today. Um, and not, and you know, and, and but to think about that entire opportunity uh, as early in the process as possible, and that takes a little bit of capacity and a little bit of a view of what the world is going to look like um, versus today. But I think we're starting to see some very strong signals, and and you know what we want to do is find some opportunities to test different models and show how that can work because it's you know it's not going to be all of a sudden a local government and utility are just going to figure it out. There's going to be some you know, projects that really push them to test the limits of what's going on, and that's the kind of thing that, that, that we want to see happen. And we've got some tools now that allow people to test out a cogen system. Great, Tom, thanks. Let me ask one last question to Jared, and then I've got a couple for you, Tom. We've got about five minutes, I think. Jared, just to be clear, uh, one question was on, you know, at least the discussion so far with the system that your own, uh, just to be clear, that the O&M costs would be included know, in the longer term PPA, correct? Yeah, I think that's a, that was a question I was going to touch on is um, we, we don't have to pay <clears throat> over the long term. One thing I would tell, one thing I would say is though, this company, um, Solar Good Storage, we, uh, it's a new company and, you know, the, when we look at things like this, we look at them as long term partnerships. Um, so we need to consider, um, you know, is this company going to be around for a long time? Um, are we going to be able to be in a 10-year, 20-year partnership with them? Um, and what happens if they go away? If anything happens where they don't exist anymore and this battery system defaults to us, um, can we circumvent that system? Or are we, do we have to maintain it? And what's the cost to maintain it? Um, so these are things that we're trying to work through also. Great. Well, that's great, Jared. Thanks very much. Uh, hey, Tom, a couple quick questions. Let me give you three that came up. Uh, one, it maybe relates to what you were just talking about. Are there any legal barriers, you know, to making progress in some of the projects you're seeing? It sounds like there are. Um, secondly, uh, there's a question about does enterprise have, or maybe it was a question about something I'm not familiar with, an enterprise microgrid in New York City. And then third, uh, are you looking at solar thermal? in any of your facilities that you've mentioned? So good questions. Um, the, uh, let me deal with the New York one. Uh, we're in the middle of the sort of what I would call the early phase of work in New York on a microgrid project opportunity. And that's, that was the one with Con Ed and the New York City Housing Authority. So we're looking at about 1,000 units of public housing located in Brooklyn. Um, where the utility has a fairly serious uh, set of is operational issues around serving peak demand as well as the need to address key resiliency 
imperatives around uh, storm events and the need to ensure that its grid there is going to be able to work together. Now, they that process and that scale has walked the utility into an environment where they're quite interested in looking at microgrids. That's not always something that you find from a utility perspective. So it's a real good opportunity there, and you have the public sector and utility all working together on it. Uh, and, and one of the things we need to do is really scope out what the technical solution could be, connect that to some trajectory of project phasing that could work economically, and then and then really sort of put that into a project planning model. Um, back to the first question, you know, almost every community is going to have uh, a set of barriers that are going to need to be overcome, um, and I don't want to I don't want to make that sound like it's it's a uh, unattainable. It just does require close co collaboration with local government, with the utility, if it's an investor-owned utility, the regulatory authority. But virtually everybody now is starting to be aware of these issues. And the more that we can create demonstration projects, pilot project opportunities, where we see value in beginning to place some of these solutions in a, in a in a context where they can test out how it works, get comfortable with the technology, satisfy everybody around the economics and the risks with the project, then we're, we're going to start to see this stuff move, uh, start to move relatively quickly. And that circles back to the last piece, which is, you know, somebody talked about solar thermal. Why this is going to start to move very quickly is that, you know, quite simply, there's a lot of value to be gained from having a, a more decentralized grid solution that's able to manage peak demand locally and able to store energy on a very short-term basis. Um, and so those become assets that create value. Those are positive value streams with positive cash flows. And so it will be attractive to pursue these where you can begin to unpack the regulatory barriers. Solar thermal represents just one more piece of that, which is, is this creating value in that context? And uh, the, the short answer will be not in all cases. Where you have a project, for example, that may be going to a modular cogen solution, doing solar PV on, or solar thermal on top of that may not be cost effective. It's hard to tell. You really have to do the math. But it's not hard to do that sort of evaluative comparison. Uh, as to how it fits in. Um, in other contexts where you have super high density, solar thermal could be a, 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 a sort of top off, but it's going to struggle to provide for a real base level of load. So solar thermal is a very strong solution in a mid-density or lower density context, uh, and it can make sense as an as a add-on in many other places. And so the key there is to really recognize it's, all, it's as much about the economics of the big solution? Is it cogen? Is it distributed storage? Is it uh, solar PV and solar thermal? As it is just trying to solve for each one independently from each other. Thanks, Tom. Um, I see we're at our 3 o'clock uh, time. And Sam, so we're going to maybe go over a few minutes. We still have quite a few people on. We've got a couple more questions to answer. So are we OK doing that? Oh, that should be fine. I believe Tom does have to leave uh, pretty soon, though. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could take a couple minutes, and then I'm going to have to jump. Okay. I think these are probably for, um, let me ask, I think, Rob, this may be yours or Jared. This is a question about the 250 kilowatt battery system. What's the load duration? You know, what's the ride out capacity? What kind of batteries are you talking about? Well, these are lithium ion batteries. And it depends on how much load you're covering uh, from those batteries. So if it's if it's a um, if if it's a limited amount of load, you can cover it for quite a while. Um, if it's if it's a substantial load, then it's then not not as long. Um, so uh, you know that's um, I, I think I think the uh, the, the key to their they discharge and charge easily there there they can, they can recycle quickly um, they're they're a useful large size battery storage system and they're modular you can you can add more if you have much larger uh, uh, storage requirements but I think in general uh, solar with storage or uh, storage is an auxiliary or hybrid uh, technology for other kinds of larger load um, um, uh, backup. So it's not to replace building load, 
but to augment or to provide black start, store, uh, black start capability to other uh, standby generation. And I think one thing to underscore here is that, you know, a big part of this investigation, and I know Jared's going to go through and other projects will go through, is simply identifying the load you want to cover. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it, it could be uh, lighting, it could be uh, cool rooms in, in, for, in assisted living. I mean, you have to be very clear about what you want to cover and be careful about it, and that's the way to then uh, impact the, con the sizing question. So one affects the other. Um, I, guess, I guess is the answer. Yeah, a quick example would be, uh, for instance, elevator, uh, uh, covering co elevator load. If you're running the elevator all the time, uh, you're going to need a large battery. If, it's, if you're just going to do it on demand, uh, on schedule, when you're going to use it in an emergency situation, it could be exactly what you needed to use uh, solar storage. We just had one question about the mass program that you mentioned, Rob. I can answer that. that. That the money that we're talking about there in Massachusetts, which is I think 40 million, was state money. Um, this is money that came from a variety of state sources. I think including alternative compliance payments under their RPS program. So this was a major commitment of the state um, to f to help fund these programs. Other states can do the same either out of existing system benefit charges um, or through other sources. And, and we have, we've written about the MASS program. We think it's a very, very good program that other states should be looking at as a model. So I think that that's, we, I think that that's it. There are questions about the slides and, and so forth, Sam. So maybe if you could pick those up. And I want to thank everybody for, uh, for doing the presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. And there is contact info on the screen. If we did not answer your questions, uh, you can feel free to get in touch with us uh, after the webinar. And thanks again very much.